Welcome back to the classroom. My name is Mr. Wong and today we'll be covering module 8, applying chemical ideas, inquiry question to analysis of organic substances. And we're going to be focusing on this dot point here, um, looking at how to analyze the simple structure of organic compounds. Specific focus is proton NM NMR. Okay, so we're going to firstly look at how uh, MMR works um, and also how to interpret the particular spectra. Uh, in this particular lesson, the reference is here. Um, just to explain what we're going to be talking about, we are focusing on HNMR or proton NMR, um, and then we'll talk about in the next lesson about uh, the carbon version of it, which is pretty much very much similar. Now, what I want to firstly talk about is how the actual technology works. Um, and it comes with this idea about the concept of how uh, charged particles can make magnetic fields. So what we actually know is if you have a charged particle, um, according to the laws of physics, a spinning charge is able to generate an electric field. Uh, the reason being is because it's generating an electric field, changing the electric field will always change a um, magnetic field here. So you have your magnetic field being generated here. Um, we actually call this uh, the spin quality or the spin behavior. And as you can see, uh, any charge, um, if we're looking at maybe an electron, for example, can have two different spin qualities. It can have a, a plus half spin or it can have a negative half spin, what we call the alpha or the beta. It's not exactly critical that you remember this for um, this particular syllabus outcome, but it just gives you a little insight on how the technology works using this quality or using this particular um, spin quality that we have. Okay, so we are going to be investigating uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. That's um, what the actual structure is. Um, so what is uh, nuclear magnetic resonance? Um, it's a useful technique that chemists uses to write information about the environment in which the nuclei or the specific uh, atoms are structured between each other. Okay, so say for example where we have this diagram here of the nuclear magnetic resonance, we have two lines. These two lines are important because it specifies the number of carbon environments we have. We'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by the chemical environment, but if you can see here the formula for ethanol, these two carbons form two different types of bonds to each other and that will give us an indication of the number of peaks. Okay, now let's firstly talk about how um, MMR works. So when we place atoms uh, in a strong magnetic field, uh, their nuclei, in this case the protons and neutrons, can behave like tiny bar magnets. So if I put a magnetic field, so let's say this is uh, the particular nucleus, and they have some kind of magnetic property to it. If I place a magnetic field in where these particles are, I can cause these particles, depending on um, if they're positive or negatively charged, I can make them all align together uh, in the same orientation. It can either go, in this case, with the magnetic field, or in this case, against the magnetic field, but the orientation is in the same uh, lining, or orientated in the same way. So the reason why charged particles can you know, interact with magnetic fields is because it has a spin, all right? Meaning by it has a subtle charge inside of it that allows it to produce a magnetic field and so when this magnetic field interacts with another magnetic field it will 
uh, be orientated in terms of its attraction or repulsion. Okay, you can sort of see it here. There's two types of spins, obviously, as spoken before. Um, one spin, as you can see, um, will give you a higher energy. Another spin orientation will give you a lower energy orientation here. If you actually look at the animation we have here, so assuming that north is blue, south is red, when the magnet, this magnet here, when the north is um, connected to the south, we actually have a lower energy uh, orientation. If we have the north pole facing the north pole up here, like this one here, you can see we have a high er energy or orientation. So we need to firstly obviously discuss what this energy means and then why is it when it's flipped does that. Okay, so the ability for something to spin uh, is not infrared, it's nuclear magnetic resonance. The ability to spin can occur for a nuclei with an odd number of protons or neutrons. Obviously we know that um, in the case of where we have um, the perfect balance, so if we have odd numbers of protons and neutrons, they will produce a magnetic field. Um, what will actually happen is as they spin, they're going to absorb energy that increases the amplitude of vibration, which we call resonance. Hence why the name of this procedure is uh, about nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay, So what we know is when particles absorb energy, they'll cause them to vibrate at the same frequency in which they're rotating. Um, and then obviously that just produces a bigger shift. That's what we call resonance here. Examples of uh, unbalanced or odd number of proton neutron nuclei, hydrogen one. As you can see, there's only one proton, there's no neutrons. And then carbon 13, where we have an odd number of neutrons here to protons. And so that's why the technique that we're using and talking about today is going to be discussing about the hydrogen one, which is the proton. Um, and also carbon-13. That's the two types of analysis that we can use or mainly use for MMR. Okay, so when we have a common um, nuclei, uh, in this case hydrogen-1 and carbon-13, each will produce its own spectra. So we can use carbon-1 to find out the environment of where each carb each hydrogen is connected in the molecule or we can use carbon 13 to find the environment in which each carbon is connected inside the molecule as these nuclei have spin when they're exposed to an external magnetic field um, these um, structures will be aligned with the magnetic field so similar to how a uh, magnet is swapped in its magnetic field, uh, the magnet can have a low or high energy state. And as we said, if the nuclei is spinning or connecting in the same, in a attractive direction as the magnetic field, it'll have a low energy state. So what we call the positive spin So when aligned, it's in a low energy state. If it's aligned in the opposite direction of where it should be, we give it the negative value, it's at a high energy state. So if we have a north and north, that's a high energy state. If we have a south and south, it's a low or south and north, it'd be a low energy state. So I might just write that down um, to give you sort of, an sort of a visualization. The times where we will have a low energy is the combination of north and south. High energy is when we have south and south and north and north. Okay, so that's where we get that. 
So how can we move to a high energy level? Um, to make a nucleus change to a high energy level, uh, you must supply energy. In this case, with the technique we're using, uh, the nuclear magnetic resonance, we're using radio waves. Now remember, radio waves is a type of electromagnetic radiation. It has a long wavelength. And we know that with electromagnetic waves, there's a really long uh, range of wavelengths that can be used. So depending on the type of environment of a molecule, so using our example of ethanol again, depending on where this carbon is or where this carbon is, it'll absorb a different wavelength or frequency range of the radio waves. And once it's absorbed, that particular frequency, it is going to cause the energy state of that particular environment to go higher. If we look at the general structure of um, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, simple thing here. So what we have here are really powerful electromagnets. So electromagnets is the use of uh, electricity generated magnetic fields. We have a radio frequency generator. So this will be the producer. So it produces the radio waves. And then we have a detector that will indicate. So it indicates the radio waves absorbed by our sample okay so similar to what we're seeing in this diagram naturally speaking when we first have something aligned with the magnetic field it's going to go in the direction of where uh, the attraction occurs so you can see north and south and south and north. Once we've put in the energy though, you can see how it's been flipped in the opposing direction. So the whatever sample uh, organic substance we're using, when it's placed in the magnetic field, we're gonna um, irradiate it. So we're gonna expose it to different ranges of uh, radio waves. And this is gonna cause our nuclei to flip our detector will then record the spin from the low energy state or high energy state and this will, and whatever peaks we see in that detector will correlate with the type and environment of which the nuclei exists in okay so i've been talking about chemical environments a lot let's firstly actually look at how to work out the chemical environment so a chemical environment, when we're talking about this in chemistry, refers to the bonds surrounding the particular atom that's being investigated. So let's use the example of propyl-1-ol and propyl-2-ol, and let's actually have a look. Now the numbers are already given to you, but what I want you to try and have a look at is propyl-1-ol has three environments. The reason why it's three is you can see that this carbon is bonded to a hydrogen, another hydrogen, and a hydroxyl group. And then it's also bonded to this carbon here. If we look at this carbon, this carbon here, it's bonded to a hydrogen, 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 and then this carbon here. So you can see it doesn't have a hydroxyl group. It is bonded to a carbon, but because it's not bonded to a hydroxyl group, it's a completely different environment to the one on this side here. So that gives us, that's two environments we can go off by. And then if we look at the center carbon, so this carbon here, it's bonded to two hydrogens and then bonded to two carbons. You can see, again, that's already different from 
any one of the two that we have beside it. So this is the third environment, the third chemical environment that the carbon is in. What we mean by chemical environment, what you can see now is um, what type of bonds the, the bonds of the carbons or the hydrogens are in, or you can think about it in terms of the symmetry. So obviously if it's symmetrical, uh, there's a greater uh, likelihood that the molecule um, if, uh, is in the same environment. If it's not symmetric or asymmetric, then obviously there are multiple environments. So let's look at this sense of carbon here. It's bonded to a hydroxyl group, carbon, hydrogen, and like that. So we can automatically call that the first environment anyways, um, if we're trying to look at the environment of the hydrogens. Let's try and compare the carbon here. So again, use a different color. This carbon here is bonded to three hydrogens and one carbon. So that's different from the center carbon here. If we look at this carbon here, it's also bonded with three hydrogens and a center carbon here. So this environment we have here is the exact same as this environment we have here. So in this case, they are in the same chemical environment. So in total, we only have two chemical environments for propatunol in comparison to propanol. That's going to be really important when it, you use um, this spectra to analyze uh, the different structures of the atoms. Okay, next part we have. So the energy required to flip a nucleus will indicate the chemical environment of the nucleus. Okay, so we talked about um, this one here propanol, propatunol, on an actual spectra, depending on the number of environments, in this case carbon, that will tell us how many peaks we should expect to see on the actual spectra. So for propanol, it's three peaks. If it's propatunol, we expect two peaks. So with this, with ethanol as our example here, it has two unique environments. And so you can see, we see two unique peaks on this particular spectra. Okay, so there's that. Now you can see a couple of numbers uh, on the x-axis. Uh, that's known as the chemical shifts. Now, for the actual HSC, you are given a data sheet that will tell you the specific uh, chemical shift for a particular environment so you will be told what that is you will need to use that as reference to depict these shapes okay so interpreting the actual spectra that's what we are going to do now the first thing is to note in terms of the graphing of the chart the y-axis so the vertical component here that tells us the intensity of the peak okay compared to the chemical shift, okay, which is our x-axis here. Now, that means the relative frequency that a nucleon uh, will spin in a magnetic field will have when comparing with a standard solution, the tetrathymine silylate. So to our standard which is also short as known as TMS. Now, the reason why we do use TMS, we will discuss very shortly, uh, but it has something to do with our chemical shift. Okay, now let's just compile what we talked about with the chemical environment and use uh, the example of ethanol again. So we have ethanol, um, and this one, appears to be an indicator of the hydrogen environment. Okay, so according to this one, we have three different types of hydrogen environments. So we have one, two, three hydrogen environments. For this one, we have 
one, two hydrogen environments there, and then we have the other hydrogen environment there. All right, so let's go about interpreting um, the specific charts for protons or the hydrogen one. So there's three types of things we can see. Firstly, the number of peaks, um, or the number of peaks here, sorry, uh, will tell us the amount of environments or the proton environments that exist in the molecule. The width of the spectra will tell us the uh, quantity, so how many of those environments are there in that specific um, molecule. Um, and then obviously uh, what we call the locations, it will tell us uh, where the shifts or the different types of um, functional groups that we'll have. Okay, so one, the number of peaks is how many different environmental groups. The specific position will tell us the type of functional group and the number of little peaks, as you can see, next to the main peak will tell us how many of those specific uh, groups should we expect. So location of peaks will indicate how shielded or deshielded the proton is. It will also tell us the types of hydrogen the molecule contains. The number of peaks you'll see will indicate the number of different types of hydrogen environments present in the molecule. And the intensity of the peak or signal, so the relative amount of each kind of hydrogen molecule. So the area underneath the peak will be proportional to the number of hydrogens in that environment. So in this case here, you see with this particular peak, we have three little peaks. And so that will tell us that there are three hydrogens in that specific environment. In this one, we have two peaks. You might think these two, but we don't actually count these two because they're not actual peaks. Uh, actual peaks need to be above our little baseline here. So we have two, so we expect two. And then we only have one peak here, so we only expect one hydrogen bonded to this molecule here. Okay, so you can pause this here to copy it down if you need uh, to work out how to interpret the hydrogen uh, MMR spectra. All right, uh, a couple of things we need to note is what is a chemical shift. So in the hydrogen MMR, the absorption speed of peaks are uniquely located in terms of frequency or wavelength. Uh, the location of the di different signals is dependent on both the external magnetic field and the resonant frequency. What that actually means is um, the depending on the strength of the magnetic field you have um, or you know the frequency of the wavelength you use, um, these values can be moved around on the spectra. So it's not quite the same as infrared where uh, everything has a specific range. This range can change depending on the magnetic field or the frequency used. So it's really important that we have a reference point where we can make all these measurements from. And the chemical we use is TMS. Um, this this uh, graph that we use here, that shift is based on what we, of our standard solution. Obviously the reason why this is used is it's relatively stable, non-toxic, and obviously uh, everything can be used in relations to that. So you can see if we have uh, saturated uh, carbon, carbon bonds or a hydroxyl group, there is a specific range in which they could be shifted uh, along this spectra. So you should expect if you have peaks along here and here, um, you know, it could be a um, hydroxyl group, it could be a single carbon-carbon bond. What that means is to really know for sure if that's what you have, you probably need to use other techniques like uh, infrared uh, spectroscopy to help you identify these ones here. 
Okay, so what can affect a chemical shift? Firstly, we have electron shielding. So electron clouds near the nuclei can shield the proton uh, from the effect of the external magnetic field. If you look at it here, we have a, what, what they say, a naked proton. Um, so what will happen is the uh, radio wave will interact with the proton and it will align, it will flip away, flip around, and that's all good. But let's say if we have electrons surrounding that proton, what will actually happen is the electrons will be blocking off the radio wave from being absorbed by the proton there. And so that means that it's a lot more difficult to flip the proton around. What we'll then need to do is either increase the magnetic field strength or change the wavelength of radio waves used to allow for this absorption, this flipping to occur. Okay, so that's one of the issues with this electron shifting. Now, if we have a look on the spectra, if we add electrons, that's increased shielding, okay, that makes sense. That means we need more energy or stronger magnetic field to flip it. So if we have more electrons, that will cause the uh, shift uh, to go to the right-hand direction. So to the right-hand side. So the absorption shifts upfield, so to say. If we have a de-shielding effect, which uh, a term that I used before, meaning by we've removed electrons uh, from that specific uh, proton, that's going to shift our spectra points towards the left or downfield. So by decreasing electron density, um, there is a greater absorption, which means that we don't need to use as much um, energy or we don't have to use as strong a magnetic field as intended. Okay. Other things that can cause chemical shifts, electronegativity. So if we have... So if... Um, we have really electronegative atoms like oxygen, nitrogen, or any halogen. That can affect the shift. Um, if we have unsaturated groups like carbon-carbon double bonds, remember, in this case, we have more electrons placed in that particular area, so we will see a sort of greater upfield change. Um, or aromatics, which are the functional groups, so sort of these benzene rings here. Or if we see an increase in the alcohol substitution or electronegative atoms being attached, uh, they can all increase the chemical shift. So if we look at the example here, so R is our alcohol group, by increasing the number of alcohol groups bonded to this carbon we've effectively increased the amount of shifting that occurs in the chemical. Obviously accumulative uh, shifting does occur so if for example we see here where we're increasing the number of electronegative atoms we are increasing the shifts occurring as well. Okay, so this is the example where we're putting electronegative atoms, we're increasing the shift. It can also increase just by having more alkyl groups. The distance between each element will also affect the, uh, the shifting seen here. So we, the deshielding influence of electron withdrawing groups diminishes rapidly with distance. So here we have is hydrogen. So this is really close to carbon, which means that um, 
the shielding effect is very strong so strong shielding that's just so to say if we have this one here these hydrogens here let's just redraw it out so these hydrogens here are further separated hence why there is a smaller shifting as we can see here uh, there's less electron shieldings when they're far away so that's what we're seeing here all right so now it's time to do some questions uh, what we want to consider is this particular molecule um, appears to be an aldehyde determine the number of hydrogen environments the relative intensity of the peaks and the expected chemical shifts. So here I've already given you um, the chemical shifts of the molecule. Um, so you can just reference it off here or you can use your data sheet. Okay, so since we're dealing with an aldehyde, the expected structure, we have two carbons bonded together. We have three hydrogens connected to this one carbon. We have a, so with the aldehyde, we would expect a hydrogen here and a double bonded oxygen down here. If we look at the number of hydrogen environments, there are two hydrogen environments involved. Um, how do I work that out? So let's see this hydrogen here, I'll use a different color. So this hydrogen here is bonded to this carbon and then it finds itself bonded to this carbon here. Okay, if we look at this hydrogen, it's bonded to this carbon here, bonded to this carb hydrogen here, bonded to this carbon here. So all three hydrogens here will have a same sequence in their bond structure. So this is all the one environment. So that's one and one. Let's compare the other hydrogen on the other side. So this hydrogen here is connected to this carbon. This carbon is connected to that, but it's connected to an oxygen. So this hydrogen here is bonded in a different orientation to what these hydrogens have. So this is our second hydrogen environment. So in total, there are two hydrogen environments. In question two, it says, what's the relative intensity? So that's sort of saying within that particular peak, how many little peaks will we see? Well, in our first environment, we have three. Um, we have three hydrogens or three protons in there. So in one of the peaks, we're expecting three little peaks inside. If we look at our second environment, we only have one hydrogen in that environment, so we only expect one little peak inside. So we have a ratio of three to one. Last thing is, what's the expected chemical shifts that we see? So, in this point here, we have a alkane group, so CH3. According to the chart here, the expected shift that we'll get is 0.9 ppm. Okay, on this side here, we have the aldehyde functional group. And so, that's the chain that we have here. According to the table, my expected shift is 9 to 10 ppm. So that's how you actually can use this chart to help you work out what the potential structure will be. Or if you knew the molecule, then you can work out what the chemical shifts are. So you can work backwards and forwards depending on the information you have. Okay, so answers there. And that's our summary point here. So like I talked about, we did go through the proton MMR spectra today. We looked at how to interpret different chemical environments. We looked at what chemical shift is, what can cause chemical shift. So hopefully all this makes sense. Um, if there are particular points you weren't quite sure of, I will encourage you to go back to the video and look at some of the pointers there. All right, so hopefully uh, the video 
was indeed informative. Um, please join me for our next lesson where we talk about uh, the carbon uh, version of MMR. Have a good day.